Okay, wonderful. Um, I am here to welcome you. I'm supposed to talk for five minutes, but I'm going to share my time um, in just a second and then introduce our keynote speaker this morning who was here a little while ago, but he's gone. When I started working at the care center, I started in January 1990, and the care center had this conference, big conference, like 800 people. And after the first week of working, the conference was supposed to happen. So I'm sitting at home the day before the conference, getting ready to think about what I, you know, workshop I'm going to go to. And my boss calls me, and she says, the keynote speaker is sick. I need you to do the keynote tomorrow. And then I probably threw up or something. I don't know what it was. I did the keynote. I have, it's good that you weren't around then in Sacramento, because I'm sure it was a terrible keynote. So I do have this like fear that keynote speakers are not going to be here. So we were been tracking him, um, Dr. Ford, all day. He was in the pool earlier today. He did change into regular clothes this morning, so he's not coming in a swimsuit and all wet. That's a good thing. Thank you for coming back. Thank you for bearing the 405 freeway, which I hear, sadly, is going to be under repair. For those of you who are not from Los Angeles, you may not appreciate that, the power and the impact of that. But for the 405 freeway, or portion of it to be down, is a horrible thing. I would like to do make an, uh, one brief introduction before I get started. And it is because I bought this book this morning. I paid my money, and you can't see what it is, but this is the APSEC Handbook on Child Maltreatment, of which I have three prior editions in my office. This is the fourth. It just came out a couple weeks ago. That's why I bought this one. And it's a wonderful resource about child abuse and child maltreatment, and it covers all of the important areas. The reason why I tell that to you is you may recall yesterday you were told that we have a table in the back that is manned by two people from CAPSEC. CAPSEC is the California Association on the... I'm going to let them introduce themselves. This is really embarrassing because I've been a member of, of APSEC since about 1988, so I should have an understanding of what it is that I'm a part of. So I'd like to briefly introduce to you Sue Harding and Laura Maltby, who are going to talk to you for just a couple of minutes about CAPSEC. To be fair, it's a lot of letters to keep track of. So anyway, we are, CAPSAC is the California chapter of APSAC, and APSAC is the American Professional Society on the Abuse of Children. So we're a professional society focused on child abuse, which sounds kind of depressing, but it isn't. Um, it's actually really nice to connect with other professionals who are focused in the same practice area um, as we are. So we have a table in the back, and we'd love to talk with you more about it. Um, but there's a lot of benefits to membership, including um, a monthly academic journal called Child Maltreatment, and up to four newsletters that sort of distill research down to like basic best practice guidelines. Um, you get access to all of our best practice material on the website. And we have a discount code for you today, so even better. Yeah. Um, so we're happy to talk with you more about that. Yes, and in addition uh, to that discount code, there is a discount on the textbook that um, Anthony showed you. So um, we'd be very happy to give you more information about this organization. We are dedicated to supporting professionals in the field um, and to support the work that you're doing. Um, that's what we're all about, better practice through knowledge. So thanks very much. And the California chapter is very active. Uh, we'd be happy to speak with you as far as the needs in your community or at your agency to provide experts to come and uh, do for speaking engagements or to do roundtables to learn from you as well to encourage the exchange of information. Thanks so much for your attention and time. I'm always impressed when we have somebody who's going to speak at our conference who creates things, who thinks and generates ideas, who helps to put the field together in a way in which all of us can benefit. And as, as you know, because of the lives of the people that you see, when you're a PCIT provider, you are likely involved in this intersection of young children, parent-child relationships, development, and this other issue of trauma. And so when we were thinking of presenters, one of the more significant people in the field, one of the people who has done an extraordinary job of not just doing research, but really creating a different way of thinking about those issues, about children, parent-child relationships, development, and trauma, is Dr. Ford. 
Um, he is a professor in psychiatry at the University of Connecticut School of Medicine. He has done a remarkable thing in being a PI for two SAMHSA grants concurrently, which I, when they did the RFA, it said you can only do one. Somehow he got two. That's remarkable. I will let him do a little bit of talking about himself because he's a very um, good speaker and very uh, knowledgeable person on his area, but he's also just recently, I found out, become the president of um, ISTSS, the International Society on Traumatic Stress Studies. So I'd like to introduce Dr. Julian Ford. Well, thank you, Dr. Akiza. Thank you, Dr. Timmer, Ms. Forte. It's really a pleasure to be here. What I can tell you about myself is that other than the fact that I do swim every morning and I, then I get dressed and <laughs> I go to work. <laughs> so yes. so this, is, this is proof uh, that also I've been working with families for, gosh, well, I, I, I tried to work on my own family for about 15 years and then I gave up. <laughs> I've, I've done a lot of parent-child interaction with my own parents and my sis, siblings, and hasn't worked, but it's worked really, really well with my clients. And I, I learned about PCIT probably 15 years ago, and I probably should have known about it much, much before then. But this is when uh, it really was it, it was beginning to become a part of the National Child Traumatic Stress Network. And I feel so fortunate. This is also when I was fortunate enough to have Dr. Timmer and Dr. Akiza write a chapter in a book on treatment of complex trauma for children, uh, which is just a wonderful chapter on parent-child interaction therapy. And my background is that I'm a clinical psychologist, but I don't learn much from books. Um, I read all the articles, try to keep up on the research, but my teachers are, are the kids and the families, um, and occasionally my colleagues as well, from whom I've learned a great deal. And I, I learned how to be a psychotherapist after graduate school. In graduate school, what I can recall, I went to a training program that was primarily cognitive behaviorally oriented, and this was back when CBT was just beginning. So we were really ahead of the curve, and we were really cool, but we didn't know how to talk to people. <laughs> And I, I remember my first few clients, and I, I, I remember them vividly because I was just like a deer in the headlights. I had no idea what to do, how to talk with them, how to help them. I tried to give them advice. They didn't like it. I didn't know what their lives were like, which is very true. And then finally, fortunately, then I, I, was, I was fortunate enough to go on internship at the Palo Alto VA Hospital, and they had a, a program, program called the Family Study Unit which is a brilliant family therapy training program, Virginia Satir and the Mental Research Institute folks and, and many, many other people, icons in the family therapy world, trained people there, and I got to be a third-generation person. And the most important thing was that when I sat behind a one-way mirror, one-way window mirror, and I watched one of my colleagues who had no more longer training than I had, but she'd had really good psychotherapy training and good interactional, interpersonal psychotherapy training, not, not the technical IPT, but just person to person. And I sat behind this one-way window and I watched her talk with this family and I thought, I want to learn how to do that. That's what I need to know. Because she was able to engage with them. She was able to see through their eyes. She was able to join their interaction in a way that I had never seen. She wasn't just helping them change their thoughts. She was really helping them to observe themselves. And I, I realized that's what I want to do clinically. That's what I want to understand more about. And so that's been my journey. But a few years later, I realized that all the, all the clients that I was seeing had one thing in common. And I didn't know the name for it then because this was actually in the late 1970s. And the, the term post-traumatic stress disorder hadn't even been officially coined. It had been talked about, but it didn't become an official diagnosis until 1980. But all the clients who I was seeing, and, and they tended to be people who would come to me for, uh, by word of mouth, they all had experienced traumatic events in their lives. And that really was the focus of, I thought I was treating depression. I thought I was treating anxiety disorders. I thought I was treating substance use problems. I was. Definitely. But what I was really treating was the, after fact, the aftermath, the impact, the adaptation that these folks had made in order to survive trauma. 
that then kind of schooled me. I needed to learn more about this. I remember I went on a job interview at, the, at a VA hospital back in 1990 to be a, a part of a PTSD clinical team, which the VA was just setting up and has become a large, large network, a very important network of service providers. And I remember that the, the chief of psychology said, well, we've got this job. Do you know anything about PTSD? And I said, yes, I know a lot about it. <laughs> and I quickly read up on it. But I, le <laughs> but I learned, I learned about PTSD within a matter of weeks or months. And I, I've been learning ever since. So I'm not suggesting that I learned everything I needed to know. But I learned enough, and I learned by sitting down and talking to military veterans and their families. And as I did that, I began to see, what, what is it that has changed for these people? They're just people like me, and of course, many of them had been in war or had been in, in very, very dangerous, horrific situations and had done things in many cases that they felt a deep sense of regret or even shame about. And many of them had had terrible losses and then had experienced the, the additional loss of coming back from war or dangerous deployments, coming back to a world that no longer seemed like the world they had left, where people, the people they thought they knew, they didn't know them anymore. They really felt like strangers in a strange land. I thought, this is, this is really complex. And, and when I thought about PTSD, I'll get to the slides in a moment. When I thought about PTSD, <laughs> I thought, well, you know, it, it captures some of this, but there's more. This is, this is not just having horrible memories. Yes, it, it, it often does involve having really, really painful, troubling, awful memories that just kind of haunt you, like you can't shake them. And it also certainly involves trying to do anything possible to just not be reminded of those awful experiences in your, in your life. And so, of course, there's a lot of avoidance of people, places, conversations, movies, television shows, driving into parking lots, driving in traffic, being in malls, all sorts of things. And, of course, it, anyone who's having these kinds of really, really distressing memories and is trying to just shut them out and not think about them and not be reminded of them, of course, they're going to feel on edge almost all the time because the moment you let down your guard, it's not that you're going to get shot or you're going to get assaulted, although it could be, but even when you're in a, a truly objectively safe situation now, and that was then and this is now, if you let down your guard, the memories start flooding in. And that sense of danger and helplessness and hopelessness and distress, and powerlessness and abandonment and sometimes even exploitation can just kind of flood right in. So no wonder people with post-traumatic stress are always on guard, even when they're not aware of it. And that's what we call hypervigilance, of course. But it's not really hypervigilance, except in the sense that they're not in true danger, but they are in true danger internally. That's a lot, but more. These, these are folks, and their children, their spouses, they themselves. So the whole family, multiple generations, are learning how to live with a sense of threat and learning how to live in survival mode almost all the time. And most of the time, not even being consciously aware of that. So how do we explain that and how do we help them? How do we provide them with the knowledge that then helps them to realize this is not craziness. They're not in any way deficient, defective. They are resilient survivors. And sometimes they're not surviving trauma, but they're surviving the secondary vicarious experience of trauma that comes back when people bring the trauma back with them. Not intentionally, never intentionally, always doing their best. So what are we going to do about that? Well, then I learned that there was a group in the traumatic stress field that was proposing a new diagnosis called complex PTSD, or disorders of extreme stress not otherwise specified, DESNOS. And I thought, this is it. This is it. This is the solution. And it, it really is very, very important. But unfortunately, and I will show you some of it, unfortunately, it was basically it was not allowed to become a psychiatric diagnosis, which is both good and bad because on the one hand, we don't need more diagnoses to label people. On the other hand, it's really tragic because now clinicians can't say, well, this is more than PTSD that I'm treating. 
and therefore I might need to have some tools in my toolkit that are more than the, even the best evidence-based treatments for PTSD. But it, it wasn't allowed, and the very politically. So then an, the same group decided, well, we're now, we're now given this opportunity, now fast forward to 2001, we're given this opportunity to work nationally on behalf of children who've experienced trauma. And that was the beginning of the National Child Traumatic Stress Network that Dr. Timmer and Arkeza Ar Center represents and that the centers that I'm privileged to, to lead represent. And that started in 2001, and a group of individuals who were working in that network said, well, if we can't do it for adults, let's at least try to see if we could get some kind of a formal recognition that children who've experienced complex kinds of trauma, which I will show you in a moment, and you, you all well know, that they're not just experiencing bad memories, avoidance, and hypervigilance. They're experiencing a, a wide range of difficulties, and their parents and caregivers are profoundly affected. Many of them have experienced trauma, and even if they haven't, living with a child who's been traumatized does not traumatize a parent. So let's be very clear about that. What it does is it activates a parent's protective instincts, and it activates all kinds of attachment working models that are on top of those that are the most basic and fundamental to provide caring, responsivity, a sense of empathy. In addition, it activates parental protectiveness that and the child into a kind of a survival state. And when that happens, then that's a really big change. Whoops, looks like I'm going in. A now you have a parent and a child who are interacting based not just on who they are as individuals and their circumstances and their life and their capacity to learn and grow and develop and care and love. Now you're also got, you've got a parent and child who are interacting as if their survival was at stake. And in most cases, they're not aware of it consciously. It's so back of the, of the mind, it's so second nature that they're not even aware. So those parents and those children need some tools in their toolkit to be able to then interact, to be able to do the kind of work that you all do so brilliantly in helping them through with using PCIT. I work a lot with adolescents. As one of the kids who was being seen in another clinic where we uh, did some consultation, the clinical director said, I have this young man who he's back in my anger management group for the fourth time. Court ordered, the judge, he keeps going back to juvenile court. The judge keeps saying, you got anger issues. You got to deal with your anger issues. You need anger management. And he would then go to the anger management group. And on the fourth round, this anger management group leader and clinical director said to this young man, he told us this after the fact, he said, why are you back in this group again? You could teach this better than I can. <laughs> you know more about anger management skills than I do. Why don't you use your anger management skills? And the young man said, classically, he said, oh, I can use my anger management skills anytime except when I'm angry. <laughs> And, and honestly, that's when the clinical director picked up the phone and called us and said, could you come and talk to us? Because we need to figure out what is it that we can do to help our clients, adolescents, younger children, adults, all ages, to bridge that gap between their knowledge of what they need to do and their ability in the moment when they're stressed, when they're not at their best, when they're trying to deal with a lot to bridge that gap and be able to actually translate those skills into that moment. And I've talked with so many family therapists and, and others who work with families as you do, and this is really a universal dilemma. It's so difficult, and I'm sure you've worked with parents who are just so um, remarkable that they're able to gather themselves in the moment and when they're stressed and they're under pressure because they know that you or others are watching them and evaluating them even though you try to do that in the kindest and most non-judgmental way possible but parents know you know they know that that we're kind of keeping an eye and we we're charged with making some evaluations and they know that we may say things about them or make judgments about them that could be very could be fundamentally detrimental to their sense of connection or even their ability to, ha to have their child with them. So under those circumstances, who wouldn't be stressed, even with the nicest PCIT therapist possible? 
it's still scary and you are the enemy as well as you are also the, the potentially greatest source of support and the potentially greatest source of knowledge and tools. So we have this real Janus dual face. What can we do to help parents to be able to be in the moment, to regulate their emotions, to be able to regroup when they're stressed, and then to really focus in and do the kind of interactional work that you're doing? Well, that's what I want to talk about. So in doing that, I will, let's see, there we go. I have to acknowledge that I, I do have a commercial interest, but I will not push that. I, <laughs> I will tell you more about the target model, which I will tell you a little bit about today, uh, this, this morning. I'll tell you a little more about that this afternoon, those of you who would like to come to a workshop and learn more about it specifically. But I'll give you a preview. So here's what I've been talking about. Um, as I was telling Dr. Timmer, I, I love an episode from The Office where, one of, where the uh, dweeb guy, Dwight, says they're not – my office group is not paying attention to fire safety. We had a fire safety training, but it was PowerPoint. PowerPoint is boring. <laughs> I'll try not to bore you. All right. You know that the families you've seen, the adults, the kids, many of them have experienced many of these types of victimization. Not all, and no one has experienced all of them, but for so many, this is, this is what the, the background of their lives. It's not all of their lives, but it is a fundamental, critical part of their lives that we cannot ignore, okay? And we know that more than half of all children in the US and the United States are exposed to victimization every year. Not just once, but every year. And we know that more than half, almost two thirds of adolescents in the United States have experienced at least one traumatic event by the time that they get to 15 or 16, often more. We know that the more adversities that you experience in childhood, the more likely you are as an adult, decades later, to have problems with things such as alcohol abuse, suicide attempts, severe anxiety, cardiovascular illness, cardiopulmonary illnesses, cancers, so health care problems that are very significant as well as behavioral health problems. We know that unfortunately many kids in the general population, not just those who we see clinically, or you see clinically, or those who are in the system, in the child protection system or in the juvenile justice system, that kids all over the map, many of them, unfortunately, a minority, but still many of them have experienced not just one, but multiple types of victimization. And they are what David Finkelhor calls poly victims. Okay, I don't like the term victim, but we'll just use that victimization to, to indicate they've experienced a traumatic threat to their life or somebody they care about or losses that have been horribly traumatic. And in many cases, multiple types, not just incidents, types, domestic violence, family violence, community violence, bullying, losses, serious accidents, multiple types of victimization. And we know that of the, those kids who are poly victims, say the kids who have experienced the most types of victimization in any particular, uh, at any particular time. If you look at kids who are ages three to six, the 10% who are poly victims have experienced between, have experienced nine or more types of victimization by the time they're six years old. Now that's only one in 10 children, but that's still an enormous number. And of adolescents, we, we found that, that those in the community who are poly victims, about one in 12, that says 8%, that they'd experience between six and 11 types of trauma, not just incidents, types. And they're the, they're the kids who are on that dotted line that you see where each one of those items is a type of traumatic exposure and the vertical axis is the likelihood of exposure over their lifetime and one being a hundred percent and you can see that the kids with the dotted line those are the kids who've been poly victimized they are so profoundly likely to have experienced not just accidents illnesses disasters but also physical assaults sexual assaults sexual abuse physical abuse chronic neglect so what does that do how does that how does a child adapt to that well children and adults adapt by protecting themselves the best defense sometimes is a good offense, so they become reactively aggressive at times. Sometimes they go the path of 
breaking the law or doing things that are outside the bounds. Many times they associate with other kids who are doing that as well because they're looking for kids who have a common experience and who know what they know and understand their perspective. And they often get labeled as oppositional defiant, often diagnosed with ADHD. They're, they're often drawn into substance use. They unfortunately, tragically, at times will self-harm purposely. They'll often be extremely reckless because once things have happened to you, bring it on. After what's happened to me already, what else could there be? I can handle it or I need to prove that I can handle it. And they are often just completely bound up in grief and the sense of loss. And as a result, they can end up feeling suicidal, depressed. They can have problems with panic, which is very similar to hypervigilance and hyperarousal, and have problems with sexuality, eating problems, sleep. Who can sleep when you're hypervigilant and on guard? And very often, they fundamentally feel that they are damaged and to blame. So, and a sense of utter hopelessness. But they go on. That's why it's so remarkable. These are kids and parents and families who are incredibly resilient. Facing these kinds of dilemmas, they persevere. And the fact that they get to us is really a miracle. And it's a sign of their resilience, not a sign of pathology or weakness or deficit. So what's the common denominator? These are kids and families, parents, who are basically in survival mode. And I, I would say that that begins with hypervigilance, but then it also includes protecting yourself and others. Oftentimes, it's not aggression on behalf of me. It's, you can't do that to my family. You can't do that to my mom. You can't do that to my friend. And they, they often appear to be completely indifferent. But they're fundamentally, deeply concerned. They just don't know what to do about this. So in many cases, these are the kids who you see who can't seem to stop and think, who can't seem to let go of anger or grudges, can't use their anger management skills, can but don't sometimes, can't seem to set or stick with goals, can't really tell who they can trust, and don't really want to trust anyone, but sometimes trust exactly the wrong person, and often can't remember their skills at the times they need them, even though they are brilliant at coping. And they're not, they're not dumb, they're just occupied. And they often end up having problems in school, as you well know, as well as problems across the lifespan. So this group in the Child Traumatic Stress Network said, we need to have a way to kind of funnel all of this down. It's complicated. It's too complicated for us to wrap our minds around. And clini as clinicians, how can we be trying to focus on all this, all these complexities? Let's try to distill this down. What's going on for these kids and often for their parents as well? And we said, well, it really looks like there are three ways in which these kids and parents are dysregulated. They're having difficulties with self-regulation in three basic arenas. The first of which is the most fundamental, and that is being able to just manage your emotions. And that has to do with being able to live with and regulate and, and be attuned to, not control, your body. Okay? And so that could take, oh, excuse me, we'll come to that in a moment. And as the, that is the result of victimization, but also what would be very familiar to all of you, which is fundamentally not having been able to establish secure attachment bonds. Again, not through any, the fault of anyone in most cases, if not all. The, cir the circumstances mitigate against attachment security because you can't live in survival mode and fundamentally feel secure. Over time, if you understand that you are experiencing a kind of a drive from within your body, not just your mind, but your body, to try to protect yourself, you can have that same com compulsion to just be always vigilant and on guard and watchful and tense, but you can also learn how to actually shift back. And that's what we'll be talking about. So the dysregulation then oops, is difficulties with extreme emotion states. And always remember that these are not always the obvious intense explosions of emotion. Sometimes they are a fundamental absence of any emotion or the appearance of an absence of emotion. So these are kids who seem to feel nothing, seem so numb, and sometimes they are dissociating. 
but it's fundamentally because they're experiencing more intense emotional activation than they know what to do with. So it can, be, it can look like very intense emotion or it can look like no emotion at all. And those are actually two sides of the same coin in most cases. Then, of course, if you're experiencing those kinds of extremes, it's often very difficult to recover. And that's where kids and adults say, what do I do when I'm feeling that way? Other than just trying not to feel that way, which never works, what do I do? We'll get there. This may lead to dissociation, as I mentioned. It may lead to a fundamental difficulty with what uh, I was just talking to a colleague yesterday who said the key here is awareness. If you can put what you're feeling and what you're thinking into words, that activates the prefrontal cortex. We'll get to that in a moment also. And if you can put what you're feeling and thinking into words, that changes something in the brain that's so fundamental. But if you can't do that because you're just basically so overwhelmed with emotion and you're alexithymic, that is, you can't put your emotions into words, then you're never going to be able to actually reset a part of the brain that is, drives hypervigilance. I will show you that. Well, if your body and your emotions just seem uncontrollable, shut down or just constantly erupting or going off into anxiety states or depression, then, of course, it's going to be very difficult to pay attention. So the crucial thing here is this is not just attention deficit. This is attention focusing, focusing on threat. So as opposed to kids who are having difficulty with any kind of focusing, other than perhaps video games or very intense stimulation, these are kids who may have ADHD, so I'm not suggesting that that couldn't be a co-occurring difficulty, but their attentional problems are fundamentally that they are more focused on figuring out what's going to happen next that's going to hurt them or somebody they care about, and they're usually not even aware of that. Or they're fundamentally trying to not think about anything bad, which is that avoidance again. And as a result, they often don't know how to be safe. And they'll often take risks and do things that are really dangerous, sometimes willfully because they're trying to prove that they can survive and they can overcome and they can get through something that they didn't feel they got through before. And sometimes it's just because they, they just don't know their limits because they haven't been able to settle down in their bodies enough to be able to know when they're safe and when they're not. And as a result, they often will rely on forms of self-soothing that can be very problematic. I don't like the term maladaptive because it's actually adaptive, but there are costs to doing things like regressing or self-soothing in a way that may actually involve self-harm, which is the next uh, element that we're, gonna, that we're talking about here. Sometimes as kids get older, it involves using substances, tragically, and addictions or other kinds of addictions. So these are attempts to soothe oneself that become addictive habits and become very, very severe problems, of course. And you see that, I'm sure, all the time. And as a result, if this is what's going on in your life and in your mind and your emotions, it's going to be hard to set goals because your main goal is just getting through the next five minutes just dealing with whatever you're dealing with and not losing it or not getting into more trouble, which is a terrible way to have to live. And as a result of that, you're probably going to feel as though there's something wrong with you, which is so tragic because these are kids or parents or both, and there's nothing wrong with them. They're just trying to cope with survival threats. And if we don't recognize that and they don't know it, because theoretically everything's fine now, they're never going to recognize and understand that it's not that it's normal to feel this way or to have these reactions. It may or may not be normal, but it is perfectly understandable. It makes sense. These are people, kids and adults, who are reacting logically to a sense that they're not safe. And that makes perfect sense. The only question then is how can we help them to begin to regain a sense of safety even though we can't, we can't promise them that everything will work out perfectly or that they won't be subjected to more stressors, because they will be. Hopefully not traumatic, but they will be, and they are. We'll get to that in a moment, too. As a result, of course, it's going to be very difficult. If you just feel like there's something horribly wrong with you, even though you don't want to admit it, then, of course, you're never going to really fundamentally feel that you could deserve to be close to another person 
or cared for. And even if you have the best caregiver in the world, it's going to be very difficult to settle into a sense of trust and security because you know there's something wrong with you. And it's nothing about the caregiver necessarily at all. And as a result, then, you're going to tend to be persistently defiant. And your kids, as they get older, get labeled as oppositional defiant and conduct disorder. And really, at kids who sometimes get in the juvenile justice system labeled as callous and unemotional, that they only think of themselves and they just don't really care about anybody except sometimes wanting to hurt others. Most of these kids don't want to hurt anybody. They want to protect. But if they have to protect with aggression, they will do that. And as a result, then, they often are verbally and physically aggressive. And they often don't really have a sense of where they begin and end and where someone else begins and end. And so they will sometimes be too promiscuous, excuse me, promiscuously attachment-seeking, the kid who runs up to every adult and tries to hug them. And sometimes they won't let anybody get anywhere near them, the kid who has basically the stranger reaction of the nine-month-old on, 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 on and on into the rest of their life. And, of course, they're going to have a difficult time taking other people's perspective because they're so busy just trying to figure out who they are and what they're about and how to get through life. But sometimes they care so much that they become empathically over-involved. And that's the kid who's trying to protect their mom or dad or their siblings or their friends and gets into all kinds of trouble and doesn't take care of themselves and then becomes the adult who always sacrifices themselves, puts themselves last. Well, this is a, a way of distilling down some very complex difficulties, but it's pretty complex still, isn't it? It's really a lot for any child, any parent, any therapist to cope with. So what are we going to do? Well, first of all, is this for real? Is this actually something that, that kids experience? Well, according to a survey, international survey of clinicians, some of you may have participated, that we did several years ago, these clinicians, when we asked them about these kinds of difficulties, we didn't say this is developmental trauma disorder. We said, do the kids who you see these are pediatricians, these are psychologists, these are marriage and family therapists, these are social workers, these are counselors, these are people from all kinds of backgrounds, advanced practice nurses. And they said very consistently, yes, the kids we see who have been through those kinds of experiences where they've been victimized and where they fundamentally have not been able to establish a sense of secure attachment in their primary caregiving relationships, these are exactly the kinds of problems that we see. So help us with that. And we've also interviewed kids and parents. We're doing a field trial study, which I won't bore you with all the details, but we will, we, we will be publishing this. The papers are in review, and we've interviewed more than 200 kids and parents, and we've interviewed another wave, so we are up to 500 now. And what we found is when we interview kids and parents about these kinds of difficulties, those who've experienced multiple forms of victimization and had multiple kinds of disruptions in their primary caregiving attachment relationships tend to describe their difficulties in life, they or their parents, in exactly the way that we're talking about. And what they say, what they tell us, is that these are different than the symptoms of PTSD. And we don't say PTSD, but we ask them about PTSD symptoms, and we ask them about these developmental trauma reactions. And we can see there's a separation. The kids who are experiencing the developmental trauma difficulties, they tend to have the backgrounds we're talking about. Other kids who have had really, really scary things happen in their lives but haven't had the kind of victimization, polyvictimization, and attachment disruption, those kids often have PTSD symptoms or depression or anxiety. So they have real difficulties. But they don't tend to have these developmental trauma kinds of reaction. And the kids who have the developmental trauma reactions tend to also have symptoms that would lead them to be diagnosed with oppositional defiant disorder, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, and panic disorder, even when we rule out the effects of PTSD. So there's something here that is more than PTSD, and we need to be able to help our parents and help them help their kids when they're experiencing this. So Here's what we do. I'll give you a brief highlight, and then you can learn more if you want to come to the workshop this afternoon. We basically take the best research from neuroimaging, and this is a summary, which I will not, I will leave it up for a moment while I talk. If you want to look at it, you can. 
Martin Teicher is a researcher at Harvard who's done, who reviewed hundreds and hundreds of neuroimaging studies, including his own. And he basically concluded what I will show you on the next slide. The words are right there, but let me show you in pictures. Oh, and this is a book that tells a little bit about that. Okay, here's what we show kids and adults. Not really, really young kids, but elementary school kids and on up and adults. Okay, we show them a picture of their brain and we say, Did you, do you know how your brain works when, when you have stress? And most of them go, yeah, my brain gets, boom, it goes, it fritzes out or it shuts down. I say, well, actually, here's what's happening in your brain. Let's see if this makes sense to you. What's happening is that when something is stressful in your life, it could be a really big, big thing, it could be something horrible, or it could just be something that's a little frustrating, or, or it could be a happy stressor, something that's exciting. What happens is your brain immediately turns on in one area, and we call that the alarm. We know that as the amygdala, part of the emotional brain. And you can see where that is deep in the middle of the brain, okay? That is the alarm. And by the way, you all know this alarm too, because that's the alarm that goes off in your brain when you realize, oh, I've been daydreaming. Oh, I need to pay attention, <laughs> which nobody's doing here now, okay? Or when your spouse says to you, were you listening to me? Did you hear what I just said? <laughs> or when your kids say, I don't want that. I'm not eating that. I'm not going to do that. Just forget about that. Or when they say, well, curfew, I don't care about curfews. I'm going to, I'm a... I'm an adult now. I can do whatever I want. And you're going, wait a minute, you're 13. This is, not, this is too early. That's the alarm, that reaction that you have. It starts in your brain. You may feel it in your body, of course. That's where we tend to feel it, the autonomic nervous system and the HPA axis and all those stress hormones. But it starts in the brain. And it's this one lovely area called the, that we call the alarm, okay? And everybody can relate to that. Everybody knows that everybody in the world has an alarm in their brain, okay? So then when the alarm goes off, what happens is if your brain is really working well, then an area right next door to the alarm, which we call the memory filing center, we know it as the hippocampus, basically that's, that area of the brain then kind of gets a signal to, hey, what's going on here? And in down-to-earth terms, the, the memory filing center basically is where we get that sense of, oh, yeah, I know this, or I know something about this, or this, is, this reminds me of that other situation, or, yeah, I know what's going on here. Even before you really consciously know, okay, this is what's happening, here's what I need to do about it. First, you have to have, you, you have to draw on your brain's amazing amount of information about what's relevant here to help me figure out what the meaning of this is. What's the meaning? It doesn't matter exactly what colors there are or how much stimulation or how things are going fast or slow. What does this mean? And if you don't know what it means, you're, you're really stuck. Because now you just, you've got something going on and you have no idea. But the brain is fantastic, our brains are. So first, we get the alarm, wake up, then we get the what's going on, and then that information gets sent up to the thinking center, which is a little bit further up in the brain. See the distance is a little bit uh, further away there. And that's the area of the brain that basically helps us figure out, here's what I'm feeling, here's what I think about this, and here's what I'm going to do, or here's what I at least need to try to figure out what to do. So when that's all working, our brains are so amazing that when the alarm goes off and the memory filing center provides helpful information so we can sort of figure out what's going on, and then the thinking center is able to put, the all, put that all together, it's the arrow underneath that's the crucial thing. That thinking center integration, pulling together all of this wonderful information and figuring out this is how I feel, this is what this is all about, this is what I need to do. When that happens, it's not just that we come up with solutions or that we come up with brilliant ideas or we cope very well or we make the most of situations. It resets the alarm. And every time that, you, that we show this to kids or adults, they go, ah, okay. And that's what I'm having a hard time with because I have an alarm that goes off like disaster, emergency. And when my alarm goes off, it's so big that I can't figure out what's going on. I just feel like 
it's horrible, I'm confused, I don't know, what's, I don't know who, who these people are, or I don't know why they're doing what they're doing, or I don't know what I can do about it. That's the memory filing center not being able to retrieve that, those crucial pieces of information. Not because it's not working, but because it's getting this massive surge of input from the amygdala, the alarm, that's basically almost crashing it. And then the information that goes up to the thinking center, of course, is like, yeah, this is terrible. Or forget it, just shut down. Just forget it. And when that happens, the worst part about that is the alarm never gets reset. And that, I would submit to you, is what hundreds and hundreds of brilliant studies of pictures of the brain and neuroimaging have taught us is happening with kids and adults who are experiencing post-traumatic stress and this kind of developmental trauma. So then, of course, the question is, what can we do to help them? Well, I'm not going to be able to give you a complete answer, but let me give you something practical to take with you. Okay, this is not an exercise. This is a model to think about. This is what you do. This is what you do with the parents you're working with. This is what you role model for the parents you're working with. This is what you help the parents begin to do or do more of or become aware of doing, which is perhaps the most important thing. This is how we all reset the alarms in our brain. It's as simple as SOS, which is not simple. <laughs> but we can say it simply, and it can be taught, okay? But I really want to be very clear about this. This is the same thing. This is something I've learned from PCIT and other really wonderful interactional therapies. This is not something that we ever go and say, you've got to do an SOS and do my SOS. Every time that I've ever worked with a trainee who said, well, I, I told this adolescent who came to our trauma clinic that he needs to do an SOS. And he said, I'm not doing your SOS. I don't like your SOS. I don't know what that is. That's, that's some adult nonsense. You know, you people, you don't know my life. You're from the suburbs. You have no idea. And the young man or young woman is right. They're absolutely right. We don't want to tell people to do this. We want to help them to see that this is what they do when they are able to actually regroup. And no matter how difficult the developmental trauma impact has been, kids and adults still have times where they are amazingly able to regroup, even if that is something that is the exception rather than the rule. And when they do that, they usually don't notice it. Now, you help them to notice that. You help them to see when they're interacting, when a parent's interacting with their child, you help them to see when they're able to just pause and step back a little bit in their mind. And before they rush in or do something that they might ordinarily do on kind of a habit, to be able to stop and say, okay, how is it that I really want to interact or be with my child? Do I need to be a little calmer and be patient while they go through some of their ups and downs? Do I need to up my energy level and really join with them and help them to kind of contain that energy and rather than trying to shut it down, rather than trying to lock it in? Do I need to think about my tone of voice, not because I'm a bad parent, but because that stress is starting to creep in and what I really want is to be able to express how I feel and what I want and what I expect from my child and how I'm going to help my child in a way that is what they can hear and not just what I'm feeling, even though what I'm feeling is important. Well, what every parent is doing, what every therapist is doing is these three things I would submit to you. So check it out. Is this how you kind of self-regulate when you're working or in your personal life, but say when you're working with a family and it's stressful, don't you probably start off by just doing something to sweep your mind clear so that you're not just going, okay, I got to stop this parent from doing this. I can't let this happen anymore. This is not good. I'm going to look like a bad therapist because I'm not making any progress with this family. All those thoughts that we all don't want to acknowledge, but that if anybody here doesn't have any of those thoughts, um, I'd like to meet you afterwards and <laughs> learn your secret or, or sign you up for long-term therapy <laughs> because it is the human condition, okay? And we, we know we're not perfect yet. Okay, so you step back in some way. It may not show at all, 
It may be completely invisible, but in, within you, you step back, you focus for a moment on, you know, what am I feeling? You know, where, oh, you know, oh my gosh, I'm, I'm so tense. I need to just kind of breathe for a moment. What is it that's really crucial here? So you move right into that second step. The, the S is the sweeping the mind clear and, the ref, and the, just the refocusing. And then there's the orienting. My guess is that you do this all the time. You step back and you say, okay, this is not going so well with this family, or this is going really great, but I hope I can help them keep it going. Rather than getting into a pressured mode and trying to push things or drive things or pull things, what is the one thing that I can focus on right now that would be most helpful to this parent and this child? What's the one thing that I can help them to focus on, and what's the one thing I can focus on? Is it being able to just enjoy being together? Is it being able to step back and say, you know, I, I can actually help my child to contain a little more. And that doesn't mean that I'm an angry, harsh parent. I'm just providing some structure. Whatever that may be for you at that moment, that's what then you turn around and you provide some guidance to that parent at that moment or you provide a, an observational comment that helps them see something that they're doing that's really wonderful that they might not have recognized. And when you do that, you're helping you and them. This, by the way, is the best approach that I know of to deal with secondary trauma or vicarious trauma or burnout before it becomes burnout. What you're doing is you're helping that parent to go back and draw on their memory but drawing on their memory specifically about what it is that really means something to them that they value, that represents who they are as a person and as a parent. And you're not doing that by saying, hey, let me just tell you, you know, I want to pat you on the back and give you lots of praise and boost your self-esteem. No, what you're saying is this is really a wonderful thing you're doing with your child, and I, I want to share that with you. I want to help you see that. And then you can decide how to handle the next situation. But I want you to be able to see what you're doing right now. And for us to be able to help our clients, we have to be able to see it ourselves. And sometimes we have to remember with the clients who you think, oh gosh, I hope they cancel the next appointment because I don't know, I've had a hard day, it's been a rough day, and I don't know if I can take this particular mom or dad or oh, please let them cancel or Maybe they'll drop out. <laughs> and of course, nobody here thinks that ever. I'm the only one. But that's where it's especially important. It's not, this is not a way of saying, oh, oh, wait a minute. I have to be kind and loving, and I have to, I have to always see the best in everybody. No, you may not like the, a particular person a whole lot. But if your focus is on what your alarm is telling you, which is please don't, make them, don't let them come here because it's going to be too stressful for me. If that's your only focus, then of course, you're gonna be in alarm mode too, and that's gonna make it that much harder for you to then focus in on what you can do that's really helpful, and to see what you need to see in order to guide that parent and help the, that parent-child dyad. So if on the other hand, you're focusing not on, oh, I really like this person, but on, you know, why am I doing this work? And what is it that, that I hope for that I can see you know, this is an imperfect parent. Maybe this parent reminds me of somebody in my own life and drives me crazy or whatever that may be, whatever the countertransference may be. But this is a person who, let's not focus just on my reaction to her or him. Let me focus on what is it that we're together doing for this child and how important it is for me to be able to join with this parent, not necessarily like them a lot, but to join with them and to truly value what we can bring to this child's life. As imperfect as the parent may be, as imperfect as I may be as a therapist. So when you do that, then I would maintain that while we haven't done the neuroimaging studies yet, we tried, but we, we haven't been able to get the magnet going yet, I would maintain that you are resetting the alarm in your brain and you're helping that parent to begin to reset the alarm in her or his brain too. And if you want, you can even point that out to them and you can say, you know, I think what we're doing is very similar to something that I, I heard about in this 
this lecture, this guy called an SOS. And, you know, we don't have to do that, or we could, you know. But he called it an SOS because that's the only way he knew how to think about it. And what I saw you do was you, you stepped back and you just really refocused, and then you focused in on what was most important, your love for your child, what you can do that, to bring something into your child's life that, where you don't have to make up for everything that's gone wrong or everything that's bad, but where you really are bringing something unique and special at this moment. And then probably what, you didn't, what we didn't do, but we might want to just think about this as we're, as we're working together, is you might not have done a kind of a, a check on yourself, you know, how much stress am I feeling right now? But what I noticed was as you did this with your child, I just saw, it looked like your stress level went down a little bit. It just seemed like you kind of seemed a little more relaxed. Maybe not immediately. Maybe initially your stress level went up because it was really hard and your child was having a hissy fit and, and that was really stressful. But what I particularly noticed, and this is what I want to highlight for all of you, is not so much your stress level, but what I noticed was that you were thinking so clearly when you were responding to your child in that moment. And very often people don't recognize, they think, well, I'm just doing what I have to do and I'm just doing the best I can and I'm not doing very well because obviously I have to go see this therapist. They very often don't realize that they are doing things in the moment that reflect such clarity of thought. If we can just help them to, just for a moment, kind of clear away all the the residue of the stress they're experiencing and that their child has experienced, and not clear it away forever because we can't do that, but just for a moment and see what they are doing that is making such a difference to their child at that moment. And then, of course, you would point out how perhaps they could see how their child reacted too in a way that showed, oh, wow, it's like, mom, dad, I like you. <laughs> I mean, uh, I like being with you. You're fun, or you make me feel you make me feel cal you help me feel calmer. You have the wonderful opportunity to do this not just based upon how the parent is able to kind of move into a state of greater focus and clarity of thought, but also how their child is reacting and re and relaxing into a, a kind of a connection, even though that may be episodic, it may come and go, it may not be always that predictable. When you do this, I hope what you'll take away from this presentation is that you can be doing this SOS all the time. We don't teach this as something to do only when you're stressed. We teach this as something to do as a kind of a, a, a life discipline, a practice. Because the, the goal here is not to reduce the stress level, it's to increase the personal control. Stress levels will go up and down. And if they go down, that's wonderful. But sometimes you need some stress. But what doesn't happen automatically or in a natural cycle is people don't develop an, a sense of personal control unless they begin to recognize that they can think clearly under stress. And I submit to you that that's what you're helping a lot of parents to do. You're helping them to see that they can think clearly in a very stressful situation, which is parenting their child. And it's not stressful bad. It's stressful because it's so important. It's so often the center of their lives, and as it should be. And anyone who can think clearly when they are in the midst of something that is as important as being with your child that's a person who has a lot to offer their child. Beyond that, it's the guidance that you provide. And that's where you take off. And this, this is just the, the bridge from the stress reaction that we have as therapists, the stress reactions that our clients have as parents, and the stress reactions that their children have, especially if they're trauma survivors. This is the bridge from those stress reactions to being able to actually realize I can think clearly. And it's nice in, in some cases, sometimes parents and even kids like to know that that's what's happening. When I'm thinking clearly, it's not just that I'm doing what I should be doing. I'm actually changing what's happening in my brain. And I've had so many people tell me, adults on our inpatient psychiatric unit who had horrific childhood trauma experiences and now are diagnosed with psychotic illnesses, 
most of which or many of which are flashbacks and not true psychoses or some combination. Kids who I've met in juvenile detention and kids who I've met who are in foster families and adoptive families and their parents. So many times what they'll say is, if, if I just had known that I had this alarm in my brain, why didn't anybody tell me about this? And if I had just known that the way to reset that alarm, you don't just let it go off and you can't, there's no snooze button, sorry. But if I just had known that there's a way to reset that alarm, and it's as simple as SOS, that could have made a big difference, and maybe now it can. Now, with younger kids, I'll just add one thing because you probably are, are wondering about this. With younger kids, something like an SOS may be something that's not that meaningful to them, or kids who have cognitive impairments, that this may not be, this may be a little bit too uh, wonky for them. But you can use, you can do different variations. With one of the kids at our state psychiatric hospital, I worked with a clinician and we developed a, just using the simple thing that probably you've all used at one point or another, maybe many times, red light, yellow light, green light. And red light for this young man who was about 12, but he tested at about 65 IQ, so he had some cognitive impairment. Very, very nice kid, but he had all the impulsivity and all the difficulties and a lot of trauma in his life, sadly enough. For him, it was not SOS, it was red light means stop. And he, he was willing to do that. We didn't say you have to do that, we negotiated. <laughs> Said, okay, how about if when you need to stop, because the alarm is going on in your brain, he's like, yeah, I guess maybe there's an alarm in there. I don't know what you're talking about, but it's all right. It's okay. When I need to, when I need to calm down, all the staff has to say is red light, and that means stop. And then yellow light means focus. And he chose that word. He liked that. He said, I want to focus because I'm good at it. When I focus, then I, I'm smart. And he was right. That was really cool. So red light, stop, yellow light, focus, green light, choose. And he said that, okay, we'll do that. And not only did he do that, but the clinician taught all the staff on the unit where he was with him. They together taught all the kids too. They put posters up, red light, yellow light, green light. They taught everybody that that's what it means. And everybody then started going around going, red light. <laughs> oh, oh, you're on yellow. You need to focus. And they taught the parents, too. And when they did that, then everyone had a common language for basically what we're talking about here, which is how to reset the alarm. You can do it in many different ways. Think of how many ways you could do it. But I suggest use this as a framework if this makes sense to you. And feel free to use it very specifically. This afternoon, I'll tell any of you who want to hear a little more about how we do this. And we, we go through some additional steps. And we teach kids and adults how to not only reset their alarm, but how to begin to really activate their thinking center very powerfully. And that involves some additional steps that are basically the same thing repeated. Acronym freedom seemed to be a good way of kind of conveying the idea that, you know, when you've experienced a lot of stress in your life, as a child, as a parent, as a therapist, the one thing that you don't want to be is trapped by that stress. You don't want to be trapped and hijacked by your own brain. And freedom comes not from getting rid of all the barriers and all the problems and making life perfect, even though we're working on that. It comes from being able to just reset that alarm. And when you know that, you know that it's a lot, it's a lot simpler than you thought, even though it takes a lot of work, a lot of practice. That's what I'll leave you with. I hope this is helpful, and thank you very much for the opportunity to talk with you. Good morning, PCITers. I stole the microphone from Anthony. <laughs> the PowerPoint slides will be posted online, so we will have access to a lot of the wonderful things that we've heard this morning. Um, I wanted to give the introduction to Dr. Shin because I just wanted to make sure that um, everybody knew what, how, well, I've already told you how hard it is to do clinical work and research and train. And actually, we just keep piling things on Dr. Shin, and she keeps really rising to the top. 
this year, we, I don't know, we haven't talked that much about what we're doing in LA County this year, but in our effort to develop a sustainable PCIT program throughout the entire county, we have hired on, contracted with some um, excellent, we had a huge choice of PCIT trainers. We have some, an excellent group, and Dr. Shin is um, their mentor and fearless leader in this. So we kind of keep making things up, and you guys are amazing and wonderful and keep getting better and better at PCIT, and I know that when we come to the end of our project, you are going to carry this forward into the next universe. I was going to say century, but, you know, it's bigger than that, right? It's L.A. County. Um, so with that, uh, Dr. Shin has really achieved this label of scientist practitioner. She's been able to do research and carry on a clinical practice and continue training and leading. And so I want you to give her your very best PCIT welcome, Dr. Marta Shin. Thank you. That was really good. Oh my goodness. Well, it's kind of embarrassing. I'm going to use my SOS skills to get grounded. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Ford. That was so, like, as you were going through that, I was like, oh, I need that <laughs> before I go up here. Um, as Dr. Timmer said, uh, that's kind of some of the stuff that I do, but I also wanted to give you a little bit of orientation um, more about um, being Latina and about the trauma work where I've mainly really acquired some of these things. Some of the things I'm gonna share with you are really based on the research. Some of it is based on my clinical work. And um, I am from, uh, I work at the Child Guidance Center in Orange County, and we are a predominantly uh, Latino community. And so most of the services that we provide at our agency are for Latinos. And Latinos have trauma like other people, but we also have very specific sorts of trauma. And that's what I'm going to be sharing with you today. So I um, just want you to know that this is part research and part, you know, 10 years working at the Child Guidance Center, um, working with Latinos. And some of it is my own personal experience, being a Latina who immigrated to this country when I was three. If you were here last year or a couple of years ago, I showed pictures of my passport of when I came to the United States. So I'll be sharing a little bit of that with you and my experience of being Latina, being a black Latina, and what that means for us, because I want you guys to really grasp that um, and really see it. One of the things that I feel most kind of, I don't know how to feel in a room when I go to a cultural competency training is like, oh, I don't, I don't know that they feel like, it's right, it's accurate, nothing wrong was said, but the emotion was not conveyed. And there's a specific emotion to the Latino experience that you, you need someone to like make you feel it in the room. And so I hope that I'm able to achieve that and that I'm able to communicate that, this information in a way that you, you kind of get what our experience is really like and how that correlates to the very specific types of trauma that we experience as a group. Um, so con eso I'll get started. First and foremost, the use of the word Latino or Hispanic, they are nowadays kind of viewed interchangeably, but what people prefer, what people prefer to be called, how people identify, is very specifically related to the history of those words, what that history means to individuals, and how they perceive it. And my mic is coming up. Thank you, Lindsay. So how people perceive, those, how they understand the definition of those words be, affects how they use it and how they identify. So for this presentation, I will be using the word Latinos, as you see. The correct usage, uh, even of Latinos, is that um, culturally, we say Latina first. So you say Latina, and then a slash with the O, so that's the in vogue thing. But I'm using Latino to mean todos, meaning nosotras y nosotros, females and males, all right? All right. So we'll get started. Here are our learning objectives, what you can expect to learn. And if you don't know anything else, I want you to remember that we are going to be talking about trauma in Latinos, what the trauma experience is like. So what are the events that are common in, uh, to the Latino experience? 
how trauma is expressed in Latinos, what that looks like for us, and the trauma effect. And so we're at a PCIT conference, so we're going to talk about trauma effects that relate to the caregiver, to the child, to PCIT assessment. I'm going to clue you in on some things that we do in the assessment and that you may not be doing in the assessment that are little signs that uh, you might see that your Latino person that you're helping uh, might have experienced some trauma. And then we'll be talking a little bit about, well, what do we do in PCAT treatment? So I'm going to be covering a lot of information. Uh, I also do want to say that some of the information that you see on the slides is with the other presenter. I'm not going to be reading it to you and covering it in depth. I just put it on there so when it's up on the website, you have the benefit of the thoroughness of all my notes. All right. Um, so um, last note that I want to make is that even though I'm going to be talking about Latinos, uh, and I'm going to be making these statements that apply to Latinos, I want you to keep in mind that the experience, the expression, and the effect of trauma is individual. It's not the same for all Latinos. It's a very individual process. It's not uniform because you're from the same race or you're from the same culture or you're from the, from the same country or you had the same journey. It's different for everybody. So keep that in mind. I don't want you guys to think like, okay, this is what Latinos do. It, this is kind of what we mostly do, but what we do is very individual. How we respond, how we express trauma, and the effect in our lives is very individual. All right, so I thought, I'm going to share all this research. How can I, how do I really give you that experience of what exactly is trauma? And so, and what are Latinos saying about it? And I mean, I'm one Latino, but what are the rest of us saying? And so I thought, well, I'm going to make a little video. So this is a 30-second Clip, and we ask these people, these are just people, friends of people that I know. These are not necessarily uh, adults that, uh, they're actually not adults that work in a clinical population. They're not clients in any way. These are just people that we know because we wanted to see, well, what would they say if we asked them? So it's about 30 seconds. So please play. El trauma es algo que ocurre después de haber pasado una experiencia mala. Algo que te asusta. Es un daño psicológico. Pienso emocionalmente que le afecta. Tengo que revivir. Es algún acontecimiento que, que te marcó de por vida. Es algo que te pasó desde niño en tu juventud. Es una cosa fea, espantosa. Puede ser físico como una herida. Abuso doméstico. So, there we are in our own words saying kind of what it is for us, right? And I want you to see that um, and hear it in Spanish so that you had a sense of it. So what are, the, um, what are the experiences, what are some of the stats behind the experience that we have? About 17% or 57 million Americans are Latino according to the last census. And that's updated data as of 2016. 70% of U.S. adults report that they have traumatic experiences. 67% of adults claim uh, that they have experienced ACEs, which we've talked a lot about in this conference. And then of those people who report ACEs, 11% of those are Latino. So that's a lot of people, right? And the types of uh, trauma that Latinos experience, stuff that's common to everybody else. You don't have to be Latino to go through a natural disaster, to experience an accident, violence, abuse of different sorts, neglect, terrorism, war. These are things that are not unique to the Latino experience. They can happen to any human, right? So that is not Latino specific. Um, but they are things that traumatize us. Right now, you know, we're thinking a lot about um, how um, people who have recently been affected by natural disasters on the East Coast, in the Caribbean, in Puerto Rico, in Mexico with the recent. So we see that those things are not specific to Latinos, but they're things that occur to us. Um, and then as Latinos, we have very specific sorts of uh, responses. So what are those for us? They are resettlement types of trauma. Um, and so in the resettlement um, literature, they talk about pre-resettlement trauma, resettlement trauma, which is during the process, and then post-resettlement trauma. So for example, I am in a post-resettlement stage. I don't have any specific trauma related to my resettlement, but I am in post-resettlement, right? 
So resettlement is literally the process of moving to another place. And for Latinos, this happens by, entre comillas, by choice, right? That choice tends to be things for financial reasons, for better opportunities for your family. Um, by circumstances, such as unrest or war in your country of origin, or displacement, uh, not being allowed to stay, or the situation changing, like what has happened in many Latin American countries, like in the Caribbean, most Cubans have not been able to return to their homeland for political types of reasons, so they are displaced, right? Then we have pre-settlement trauma, the types of things that happen to people before they try to, before they move. And those are the typical things, the trauma. So as I said, those are just things that can happen to any person. The more interesting piece is the resettlement trauma and the types of things that happen after they make the, the move or during the move. So things like physical abuse while they're um, making the journey, rape and trafficking, gang violence on your journey, harsh weather, um, shelter or sleeping conditions while you were trying to make the journey, um, neglect, so food insufficiency, uh, death um, of people. So some of these were very clearly in the literature and some of these I asked people who I knew had resettled and had difficult journeys and they shared some of these with, you, with me. And then loss of family. So actually going through the stages of grief because you left your family in your home country. Um, one of the things as I was preparing for this talk, I was like, I like to give a talk and kind of share something from my experience that's relevant for you. And I thought, man, dude, did I have any resettlement trauma? I don't remember it. I don't feel like I did. Like, I feel like my life's been, you know, free of really major impactful events that I could really label as traumatic, right? Not that I haven't had any stressors, but that, you know, I just want to use that carefully, not loosely say that I've, I've in any way been traumatized. So I thought, is there anything that I could really share with the audience? And then it came to me, and it relates to this last point about loss of family. So my family immigrated to the United States from the Dominican Republic, and uh, my dad came first, and then my mom came after. So at that point, the Carter administration had these like petitions that you had to do and prove that you could immigrate to the country. So they, they did that. My dad came, then my mom came, and then I stayed back home. And when I was three, then my mom visited me. Um, and I was here in the country, and I remember meeting my parents for the first time. That's actually my first memory, meeting my parents, because... I remember seeing them at the airport. I don't actually remember anything that happened pre-settlement to me. I don't know what that was like. I remember reunifying with them. And while that's not traumatic, it's certainly because it's my first memory, it marked me. I, I actually recall that very vividly. And, um, and what my dad said to me, my dad told me in that moment, he's like, I'm your dad. And I had language at that point. I was like, well, great to meet you. <laughs> You know, it was almost like I had, I just, I don't even know what happened. Um, and one of the things related to loss of family, that was my personal experience, but we went home regularly, like every like Christmas and New Year and summer vacation. And when we left DR, which is what we call the Dominican Republic, DR, when we left DR, it would be like a whole caravan of my entire extended family would go funeral procession style to the airport. And we'd, when we'd get to the airport, they'd wail, like, like, like someone died. They would wail at this, it, it felt that way to me as a kid. I'm like, why are they crying that way? We're, we're just going back to Brooklyn. Like, why are we, why are we crying so intensely? And I, I, as I reflected on this thought, on this, um, that experience and preparing for this talk for you, I kind of could see how for many families, it's a significant loss to break away from your support system. And every time you have to do it, it you're reliving the fact that by choice, by circumstance, you can't be in the same country. And that that is a very significant loss and it's meaningful to people and it affects them. And I, I have vivid memories of you know, how much uh, pain it seemed like my mom would have at saying goodbye to her mom. Um, okay, so the post-resettlement trauma, uh, that has to do with um, after you 
um, resettle. And it includes things like first-generation trauma. That's the trauma that the person who went through uh, experiences. And as you heard in other talks, uh, transgenerational trauma. And so you've heard that a lot, so I'm not going to get into it, but tell you a little bit um, about what we know in Latinos, that Latinos are 10 times more likely to have trauma once they immigrate to the United States and Canada, specifically was what this research looked at, and uh, that the trauma that they report is actually not trauma that happened in their country, even though they might have, or during the journey, even though it might have been really challenging for them, but that most of the trauma that they experienced is based on post-resettlement trauma. And um, I think in the next slide, I operationally uh, define what the post-resettlement trauma. It's essentially things like um, experiencing neglect or rejection from society because of your race or linguistic difference. And so that post-resettlement trauma is actually more of the experience that they have, the fact that not being accepted as Latino, feeling like you don't speak the language, that you don't culturally fit in. And so a lot of the sort of rejection that Latinos feel and relates to their, tra their journey in resettlement relates to the post-resettlement rejection that they get. Um, in terms of transgenerational and intergenerational trauma, our greatest strength is our greatest weakness as Latinos. So our greatest strength as Latinos is that we have a lot of familismo. And familismo means that we have really strong family bonds. So the positive side of that coin is that with familismo, we are super strong. But because of familismo, we transmit like nobody's business. We, we give our kids our feelings like <laughs> you can't imagine. So just as passionate as we are for the good things that we're connected, if a parent is experiencing trauma, they really pass that on really effectively to their family because of familismo. So that's actually, it's a protective factor for us, but it's also our risk factor. Um, so trauma expression, um, this I want to say that for trauma expression, and I have, let's see, just a few minutes, um, five, okay, I'll try to make it in five. <laughs> she said I have three, I'm like, I'm going to try for five, I really want you guys to see it, okay, for this, here is something cultural that I want you to do, okay, I want you to react the way you would normally react when, I'm, when I do this following thing, okay, <gasps> Salud. Or in English, bless you, right? So how many of you are thinking that that has to do with like religion or anything like that, right? It, we just say it culturally, right? We just say salud in Espanol or bless you. And we're not really like spiritually or in a religious sense blessing someone, but that's something that really has a religious origin, but now it's just part of our cultural experience. So I'm going to share with you a few of these in the five minutes that I have left. Um, and these are... Cultural syndromes, but they have kind of uh, religious undertones. Uh, cultural idioms of distress, and then cultural explanations. And this, this will be up there. Um, I don't have time to show this 30-second video. Do? Okay, I'm playing it. So this is trauma expression. Comporta asustado si no le gusta uh, hablar o conversar de lo que tiene su problema. Es retraída, que uh, no le gusta uh, decir mucho de sus sentimientos. Se comporta siempre con miedo. Siempre tiene miedo de hacer las cosas, siempre tiene miedo de que me va a volver a pasar, me va a volver a pasar. Ansiedad y también tiene, puede tener uh, síntomas físicos como pesadilla, como que te la cabeza. So you see them say it in their own words, kind of how they express trauma. So here are some of the um, cultural sim syndromes, and these are the most popular one. I'm going to have a link for you so you can see all of them from APAL. They are ataque de nervios, which literally means attack of nerves, um, and it includes those symptoms. Then we have susto or espanto, which literally means fright, that something frightening happens to you, and then that creates 
trauma for you. Um, then we have mal de aire, or malos vientos, which is a malady caused by bad air. And then the list of all of them are by on the, at that link. And APAL, that association, produces GLADIP. And GLADIP is basically DSM in Latin America, and it lists all the cultural syndromes there. These are the most universal across all of the countries. And then some of them are very country-specific. Um, so the idioms, the way people will say they have distress is using these words, tengo nervios, I have nerves, I have dizziness or mareos, uh, siento aires, it's kind of like bad vibes or malas vibras. Uh, and someone told me yesterday when we were doing this, suavemente was like, ay, estoy despojando las malas vibras. The despojo is kind of like you're shaking it off. And then we have the cultural explanations. Those cultural explanations is the cause for this. And those can include the very popular one of mal de ojo or ojo, where someone's giving you that evil eye. It's like the hater, but it's a real experience that people, it's people hating and they, with their hating, they have the power to create these maladies in you, even to the point of death, it's believed in certain countries in Latin America. Um, and then mal por envidia, which is an illness that happens because people are envying you, which is really like haters. Um, <laughs> and this is caused or started by brujas or witches. Um, and the general term of brujeria or hechiceria. Um, and then trauma effect, I think we've covered this thoroughly throughout the conference, that it affects emotional availability of the parent. Um, it impairs parenting effectiveness. Um, in terms of the children, the children are prone to transgenerational trauma, as I shared, to attachment uh, difficulties. And then in terms of the effect on assessment, this is just for you to see on the website. Go to these places that these are the areas on the measures that we use where you might see some clues that tell you about potential trauma. And then very importantly, in the DSM-5, they added these cultural formulation interviews that if you are not on board with using them, you totally should. It helps us identify the definition of the problem from a cultural perspective, the cause of the problem that the client reports, past help-seeking behaviors and, and current help-seeking behaviors. And they're very well thought out. This gentleman, um, Fernandez, he, I mean, they're just doing such amazing work in evaluating what um, relates to culture in terms of psychological conditions. And so uh, they do a really good job at, with that in the cultural formulation interview. And then lastly, in terms of PCAT treatment, just awareness that it will affect coaching in those ways, teaching and learning, and then daily care. That because the parents are affected by this experience, having these effects, that uh, they'll respond in these ways. Um, and then lastly, I just wanted to point out again that please remember that we have a very unique experience, that we express trauma in a very uh, unique way, and that these are the ways that it affects us. Thank you, guys. Thank you.